Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, bon matin, bon après-midi, bonne soirée. Uh, je suis Louis Pelletier. Uh, je suis le moderateur de la séance numéro 3 du colloque de Mutard 2020. Nous so, sommes uh, Louis Pelletier de l'Université de Montréal, Cinémathèque québécoise et parfois Ryerson University. Uh, so we've got an exciting panel this morning, uh, some really great presentations that you've seen, that you've all uh, watched, I'm sure, on the Domita website. Uh, so before we uh, start with the discussion, uh, I'll just ask all of the people uh, attending the Zoom event who are not uh, part of this panel to uh, please switch uh, their microphones. Donc, uh, si vous êtes, uh, uh, si vous êtes pas participants à cette séance-là, s'il vous plaît, fermez vos micros. Euh, la façon dont on va procéder pour les questions, c'est que ça va se passer dans le, le chat. Euh, posez vos questions les plus succinctes possibles dans, dans le chat et puis euh, moi et l'assistant modérateur de la séance, Michael Cohen, nous allons euh, choisir et relayer les questions euh, aux participants. So, uh, Yeah, please close your microphones. And if you want to ask uh, questions, we do encourage you to ask questions. Use the chat box, and uh, we will relay the questions to the, the participants. Uh, about language, I will switch from French to English. Uh, I will mostly be using the addressing participants in their language. Uh, I won't attempt to translate everything because that would be that take too much time, but. Uh, my colleagues will try to provide uh, some translation in the chat box. Donc, pour les traductions, je n'essaierai pas en direct de traduire tout, sauf pour les, les annonces, les trucs un peu plus officiels, mais uh, mes collègues vont s'efforcer dans la boîte de, de chat de quand même uh, traduire l'essence des, uh, des discussions qui se déroulent. Donc, euh, on a une séance euh, très excitante ce matin, euh, dont le titre est « Cameras, Projectors and Trick Photography uh, ». Very exciting uh, program, our panel this morning, « Cameras, Projectors, Trick Photography uh, ». I think that when we came up with the idea of this conference, that's exactly what we were looking for. So, uh, discussions that make connections between technology, the materiality of cinema, but also the crafts, uh, savoir-faire, so the expertise of the people making the films, but also uh, engage with what's happening within the film theater or the spaces where the films are exhibited. So uh, presentations that engage with the reception to the effects produced by the, the films circulated. Donc, euh, une séance excitante ce matin sur la matérialité des outils de création des films, mais aussi sur les savoir-faire des artisans du cinéma et puis la réception, les effets produits sur les spectateurs. Donc, euh, rapidement, pour présenter les participants, euh, je les présente ensuite. Euh, je vais me permettre, je vais me donner le privilège de poser une question à chacun des participants, une fois après les avoir tous euh, introduits. Uh, so, I'm going to briefly introduce the, the panelists. I will then give myself the privilege. Uh, I'm entitled, I've worked for two years, more than two years on this conference. So and I give myself the right to ask one question to all of the panelists. <laughs> and then we will, I will try to encourage a bit of a free flowing exchange between the participants. And uh, we'll make sure to keep at least a good solid uh, 15 minutes at the end for our questions from the audience. So that's the plan. So today we are very lucky. We have uh, Guy Edmonds from uh, Plymouth University, uh, whose paper uh, is entitled Crafting the Flickerscape of Early Cinema. We have uh, Lucy Marzola from University of California, Irvine. Uh, our paper is entitled The Professional Standard, Bell and Owl and the Evolution of the Motion Picture Camera. Uh, we then have Luca Mazzi from University of Rome, uh, Tor Vergata et Silvio Alovisio, Université de Turin. Euh, la représentation était intitulée « L'écran de papier, les rôles du caméraman et du projectionniste vu par la presse italienne, 1896-1915 euh, ». Ensuite, Frédéric Tabet de l'École nationale supérieure d'audiovisuel. Euh, sa présentation a pour titre « Tanagra et la danseuse microscopique, scène et images composites ». Et puis, last but not least, Katarina, Katarina Lowe, University of Massachusetts, Boston. And uh, our paper is entitled Split Screen Effects and Early Cinema. 
So, uh, get things going. Uh, maybe have a, a quick question for Guy. I'll just follow the, the order of the, the program. So, yeah, I must say that um, your, your presentation was really fascinating. Uh, I discovered the issue of you know, Flickr uh, a few years ago. I was lucky enough, there was a presentation by Peter Kubelka at Cinematic Cubicles where he first asked the projectionist to uh, screen but without any film in the projector uh, using the three blade shutter the two blade shutter at 16 frames per second at 24 frames per second so it, it was became quite obvious to me that uh it had a really significant impact on the image so uh, the first quite specific question that i have for you because uh me with a, with a few colleagues like Jean-Pierre Sirotra in Quebec City, we have uh, we have been working on this uh, laboratory, uh, meaning that there's a collection that we can use of uh, cinematic devices, cameras, projectors that we can actually uh, handle and play with. Yeah. And we want to encourage people to have a hands-on approach to film history. So, uh, yes, so your, your, your paper was really fascinating. And I was wondering if you felt the need as you were researching the issue of Flickr to actually do experiments, like to, to build different shutters and put them on projectors and actually yeah. see with it. Uh, thank you, Louis. Um, that, that's a great question. Um, and it really zooms in on um, one of the implications of my research, <clears throat> which to some extent I... Uh, the research is, is in the paper as part of a, a wider uh, PhD research. Um, and I have got quite a long way along that road of reactivating the technologies uh, of early cinema, such as are in your in the collection that you mentioned. Um, I kind of started really with the nuts and bolts um, of the existing apparatus. And I did a sort of semi-forensic uh, look at the, in, in my case, I was looking at bioscope projector mechanisms. Um, and I collected a couple myself. Um, and I did a sort of philology of the different bioscopes out there that I could, could find traces of. Um, and um, by, by doing that, I, I really zoomed in in a way in on, <laughs> on that individual piece of uh, blue uh, shutter blade that uh, I mentioned in my, I, I showed in my talk. I, I wanted to put that in as a sign of this need to get, get back to the sort of the ground zero of evidence in being the apparatus. Um, and um, yes, so the implication is absolutely to, to make maybe replicas of these shutters that I'm talking about and, and finding out about, um, or I mean, it, it's that kind of knife edge of can you use uh, a historical artifact, something that is, is in the museum and has all sorts of uh, conservation issues surrounding it, um, or, or do you have to make new ones? Um, with the Branson shutter that I mentioned, um, the, the copy, the, the, the object in I, we did actually, uh, we, we, we put a film through that projector and we, we did experience that um, and then you find out this whole extra layer of what you have to do in order to do some kind of reenactment because then the, the lighting source of that particular projector was very weak and it, 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 it was all sorts of confounds that uh, you can't do like for like comparisons um, but if one was to do a very scientific um, uh, comparison of the technologies, including the light sources, which is uh, uh, something that I think just a few people have, have indicated now and then. We've got, in the early cinema period, we've got carbon arcs and um, acetylene and electric light. Uh, they're all giving different qualities to the light. Uh, and then what I've been looking at particularly is what, what the shutter can do as well in terms of sculpting that light that is coming from the light source and 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 then the people getting involved in in that kind of game in a way of of sculpting with light um <clears throat> so um yes it's absolutely there as an implication and i i have some practice myself uh as a researcher and an artist where i i use film technology um but i'm still working on getting myself together with a functioning carbon arc 
35 millimeter early cinema projector. It's quite a lot of steps to get to that point. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, ones that are easy to conduct in our living room. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Larry. So a question for Lucy uh, about the development of the 2709 camera, which was the standard uh, in the US film industry in the teens and 20s. Um, I'm curious about the, the relationship between uh, Bell and Owl and Cameraman, like how extensively were Cameraman involved in the design and the evolution of this camera? Like were there like regular exchanges? Uh, I know that the camera did evolve a bit over the, the the teens in the 20s, but Ben Noel added a few uh, functions. Was it uh, as a response to formal demands by uh, cinematographers or cameramen? Or, yeah, do you have any data on this? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, so yeah, that gets more into the 1920s. Um, early on, they were you know, giving, as I showed the, the photo of their prototypes at SNE. So they did give those prototypes and that's how they developed the 2709. Um, they, actually did not talk to cameramen a whole lot about the evolution, which was why Mitchell was able to come in around 1920 and take over a lot of the market. Um, and so a lot of their work in the 1920s was a response to losing that market share to Mitchell, um, who Mitchell were Los Angeles based, um, which was part of the appeal. The camera had been designed by a cameraman. Um, and so they had that really close relationship with the, the cameraman in Hollywood in particular, whereas Bell and Howe at that point in 23, 24, they start selling to the amateur market, the 16 millimeter cameras. Um, and so they kind of lost interest in Hollywood. Um, and so they you know, eventually realized that if they hold on to the Hollywood market, it actually helps them with the amateur market because they can use it as a sort of marketing tool and that, um, uh, sort of restarts their interest in 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 um, catering to professional cameramen, but throughout the twenties they were surprisingly remote um, from from them. Um, something I talk a lot about in the book is that that the geographic dif distance of being Chicago based um, kind of disconnected them when once the industry moved um, to Los Angeles. Um, but obviously they stayed they stayed in enough and um, and managed to kind of catch that before it got too far along so that they may, you know, maintained a large portion of the market. Um, and the cameras continued to be used you know, through the 1970s and 80s. Yeah, it's very interesting because I believe that Chicago remained the center for the educational film market, industrial film market. So it makes mm -hmm. sense that Bell and Howell was who began in the, six, uh, the, the 30s, possibly, you know, more, you know more than I do in the, about this, but I mm -hmm. concentrated on some substandard sub gauges. Uh, mm -hmm. like 16 that uh yeah that makes sense the, the chicago uh, connection yeah Thank it was a much bigger market for 16 because you could sell them to everybody yeah absolutely uh thanks uh i know that uh, i just saw that luca and silvio had uh, issues connecting uh luca silvio are you uh êtes -vous, êtes -vous là? Uh, the français, je vais vous, uh, vous yeah, okay uh, so I'm okay. I, I don't know about Silvio, but uh, yeah. Uh, oui, oui, oui. Okay. Oui, oui. Okay. C'est bon, c'est bon. Okay. C'est bon, c'est bon, bon. Merci, merci. Merci de vous avoir merci. avec nous. Okay. Euh, donc oui, euh, vraiment une présentation fascinante. Euh, j'ai moi-même passé beaucoup de temps à fouiller dans les journaux. Euh, j'ai commencé, euh, oui, littéralement au siècle dernier, en, en 2000. Euh, j'ai passé quatre ans dépouillé un journal montréalais. J'ai couvert huit euh, années, je crois. Donc, euh, en fait, ma, 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 en, en écoutant votre présentation, euh, au-delà de vos, vos conclusions qui sont très intéressantes, euh, je me posais des questions sur la méthodologie. Euh, le, le travail, vous, avez, vous mentionnez euh, Richard Abel, euh, j'ai mon collègue Paul Moore au Canada qui a beaucoup travaillé sur euh, les, les journaux quotidiens comme source pour l'histoire du cinéma. Euh, C'est euh, une source qui est très importante, mais la, pour les chercheurs, le, le numérique est venu changer pas mal de choses. Il y a, il y a 20 ans, quand je dépouillais le Montréal des stars, c'était sur microfilm, il fallait tout lire. Euh, J'étais curieux, donc comment gérer la, la masse de, de, de données, mais vraiment euh, écrasantes, représentées plus particulièrement par les journaux quotidiens? Je sais que ce n'est pas le seul type de source que vous avez exploré. Les journaux quotidiens, est-ce que vous avez utilisé des outils numériques, des, des fonds numérisés, ou est-ce que vous avez fait ça à l'ancienne en bibliothèque, en déroulant des microfilms, en tournant des pages? Enfin, C'est toujours le problème de chercher l'aiguille dans la, la botte de foin avec les journaux. Euh, oui, voilà. question sur votre méthodologie. Oui, mais euh, euh, nous avons euh, en Italie une production très 
euh, très, très vaste de, de journaux et revues de, de cinéma. Euh, donc, nous avons à peu près euh, 200 euh, revues de, de cinéma et euh, une partie de ces revues ont euh, conservé euh, dans euh, deux grandes bibliothèques, euh, la Bibliothèque nationale de Florence et la Bibliothèque nationale de Rome. Euh, nous avons cette caractéristique en Italie d'avoir de, euh, deux bibliothèques nationales, euh, nationaux. Et en plus, nous avons euh, une bibliothèque qui est euh, la bibliothèque du Musée du cinéma de Turin, qui a euh, un, une collection très intéressant de, de revues euh, de cinéma muet euh, italien, mais pas seulement italien, même euh, français, très, très riche. Et, et en plus, cette bibliothèque, la bibliothèque Mario Gromo du euh, Musée national du cinéma, euh, a développé une, un projet euh, exceptionnel de mise en ligne de, de ces collections de revues de, du cinéma muet. C'est un projet exemplaire pour l'Italie et pas seulement pour l'Italie, à mon avis. Et donc, nous avons conduit une, une, une recherche euh, directement dans la Bibliothèque nationale de, de Florence, euh, surtout par mon ami et mon collègue Luca Mazzei, qui, est, qui habite à Florence. Et, et nous avons fait une inter intégration euh, avec les, les revues de, en ligne de la Bibliothèque du Musée du Cinéma parce que la recherche en ligne euh, a euh, le, la limite d'être pas complète comme euh, euh, collection, qui est, le, le, les collections de, de Turin sont très partielles, mais euh, il a le, la grande euh, opportunité, potentialité de euh, conduire des recherches dans le texte, dans le full texte. Et donc, nous, nous pouvons interroger les, les textes par euh, des termes et nous savons que euh, la, la recherche linguistique euh, pour euh, la recherche sur la période muette, euh, c'est très important. Nous avons vu euh, une question qui a posé un collègue euh, dans la chat qui est, qui est une question... Euh, à propos de, de, de l'emploi des termes, comme, euh, comme identifier, euh, comme euh, étaient identifiés les, les, les rôles professionnels dans les, euh, au début du cinéma. Et, et donc, euh, la recherche en ligne full text euh, nous a permis de, de faire une, une recherche euh, même quantitative. Euh, sur l'utilisation de, de, des termes pour identifier les, les rôles professionnels. Et puis, nous avons aussi conduit une recherche sur les euh, journaux, les journaux quotidiens, mais sur ces points, je, je peux, euh, nous pouvons écouter Luca qui, a, qui était spécialiste de la recherche dans, le, dans la presse quotidienne. Oui, nous, nous avons cherché dans la presse quotidienne, mais dans la presse quotidienne, il y a, pas, il y a, il y a seulement des, des, des journaux euh, qui sont digital, euh, numérisés, qui sont Corriere della Sera euh, et La Stampa. Corriere della Sera, c'est un journal de Milan, très important, à diffusion nationale. Et, et aussi, le, le Corriere euh, et La Stampa, c'est un, un journal euh, un quotidien de Turin, qui c'est la diffusion nationale et qui était euh, c'est très important dans les années 20, dans les années 10 et, et, et dans quoi et euh, nous avons cherché les, les, les deux journaux dans les deux journaux numérisés et puis nous avons nous avons vu ça, nous avons vu quelques quelques quotidiens mais je, je, je dois dire qui c'est à à, à recherche random. C'était pas possible de faire, de, de, de faire une recherche complète dans les quotidiennes en Italie. Il doit, il doit faire euh, des de choix. Et puis, nous avons fait une un recherche sur les textes narratifs qui parlent du cinéma. Et pour faire une recherche sur les textes narratifs, nous avons, 
nous avons, nous avons cherché dans, dans les quotidiens qui, euh, qui ont des textes narratifs et nous avons, nous avons cherché dans tous les quotidiens pour trouver des, des textes narratifs sur le cinéma et puis nous avons cherché dans, dans la dans le database de la, de la, de la Bibliothèque, nationale, euh, Bibliothèque nationale de Florence. Nous avons cherché les textes, les, les romans euh, ou, les, ou les livres qui ont le, la parole cinéma dans les, dans les, dans les titres. Et puis, nous avons, euh, nous avons essayé à... Euh, grâce à Google Books. Nous avons, nous avons cherché les, les paroles cinématographes, cinématographo, italiano, pourquoi cinéma, c'est trop, trop facile, eh, cinématographe ou opérateur, sur, euh, sur Google Books. Et puis, euh, nous, avons, nous avons cherché dans la Bibliothèque nationale de Florence et des autres bibliothèques, si, pour pouvoir, si, si y a un texte narratif, si y a un texte narratif qui parle du cinéma, si y a un texte narratif qui, 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 euh, qui a les paroles, les, ou seulement les paroles cinéma en foi, ou, ou comme ça. Donc, c'est un peu le, le meilleur de deux mondes, c'est à la fois le, le distant reading, le close reading, le, la recherche numérique qui permet de cibler des termes, mais aussi, vous avez mentionné le, le, la recherche plus random, donc d'accepter que surtout dans un matériel hétéroclite, comme tout ce qui a trait au cinéma pré-institutionnel, qu'il y a plein de choses qu'on qu ne connaît pas, puis qu'on ne on peut pas, on peut pas euh, avoir, avoir a priori les, 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 les termes pour les trouver. Non, oui, très intéressant. Euh, Frédéric, est-ce que Frédéric s'est est joint à nous? Non. Euh... Non, I wrote, I emailed him. And also connected him to the tech people, but I haven't heard a response. Okay, so uh, I'll just keep my, my uh, question for Frédéric if he uh, shows up. Uh, donc, uh, so, uh, Katarina, uh, I have a question about uh, the institutionalization of cinema. So, and I, it's, I remember reading somewhere, I don't remember who made the argument, but that the fact that uh, split screen effects sort of disappeared like were not as extensively used in institutional cinema as they were used in early cinema was uh, related to the fact that uh, it was not as efficient. Uh, what I mean is that uh, all of these effects, well, all of the effects that did not involve uh, the profilmic, uh, so uh, multiple exposures, uh, effects, well, those effects had to be produced in camera because it's not before the end of the 1920s that uh, duplicating stock was introduced. So it, those effects could not be produced in post-production. So it was quite risky. There's uh, Kevin Brownlow as the testimony of a, a cameraman who uh, explains that uh, Alan Duan for one film ask, asked for a series of 27 scenes to be shot in sequence with dissolves. So that meant that by the end of the shoot, the cameraman was sleeping with the actual negative. He was just so worried about what would happen to it. So I was... Um, just curious about uh, the, the side of the question, like the uh, industrialization and institutionalization, like uh, this hypothesis that I remember seeing somewhere, uh, does it fit with what you found? And uh... Thank you for that question. And uh, that's very interesting. Um, I don't actually think that is uh, quite true uh, from what I found. Um, I think there was uh, like number one, uh, split screen composites uh, were made in camera and uh, in post production. So in, um, uh, in, my, in duplicate printing um, from the very, very beginning on Robert Paul, I think, uh, Ian, if you want to correct me, please go ahead. Um, I did that uh, like in the very first days, basically. Um, and um, yes, but uh, multiple exposure was the main, um, for sure, the main way of creating these effects. And um, but uh, you, we find multiple ex uh, exposure um, and duplicate printing, um, split screen effects throughout early cinema, through transitional era in the 20s, and then when when um, uh, optical printing comes in. Um, on a large scale um, in the late 20s, um, 
it, it becomes obviously more easy, but um, I don't think it's necessarily that it wasn't done before. Um, and yes, cinematographers did um, expose, um, I'm just thinking of Metropolis, um, the, the transformation sequence was exposed uh, dozens of times um, uh, on top of each other. Yes, it was very stressful for the cinematographer, obviously, but, um, but it was done. Um, so um, I don't think, I don't see a strong um, connection to the institution, to institutionalization of cinema. I see that um, uh, I think there's a relation between sort of abstraction in the image. So a representing abstraction versus um, a trying to create sort of a natural, um, uh, the illusion of uh, depicting reality as is. Um, that tension is certainly there and that's what I'm particularly interested in. Um, at what points and why uh, people chose to sort of break this, this, uh, this illusion of, um, of representing a physical reality on film. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I can open the discussion. Like first, maybe I can give the privilege to the panelists. Uh, uh, would you like to ask questions to your, your peers, your colleague, your fellow panelists? Uh, any questions here? If not, uh, we can open it up. I'm sure that I could not keep up with what's happening in the chat, but I'm sure that Michael uh, has uh, singled out a few questions. So Michael, do you want to relay a question oui, from... Oui, 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 oui. Um, il y a beaucoup de questions. Alors, je commence par une question, je commence au début, par une question pour Luca et Silvio sur la terminologie et le développement du terminologie. C'est une question que je vais essayer de résumer. Um, le, um, La personne qui pose la question, c'est Raphaël de Fréry, qui prend l'exemple de Portugal, où le terme opérateur englobait plusieurs positions, et puis ça s'est brisé en deux, euh, en deux termes. Euh, pardon, je cherche dans la question. Projectionniste et scénégraphiste, excusez-moi pour ma prononciation. Euh, Est-ce qu'il y avait un phénomène similaire en Italie? C'est-à-dire une différenciation fonctionnelle des termes. Euh, oui. Euh, il y a une différenciation en Italie à, de la parole opérateur, que c'est un parole, c'est le même mot dans, dans, les, dans les années 10, c'est opérateur pour, pour cameraman ou pour, pour projectionniste. Et on y va différencier euh, dans les années 20, dans euh, opérateur o camera operatore o um, proiezionista chi sa la, la parola la parola italiana per uh, uh, proiezionista ma um, il problema è che uh, quando arriva in Italia ha uh, un permesso per le proiezioniste um, non c'è di uh, di legislazione sur, pour, euh, qui va à, à intéresser la, les rôles du projectionniste avant de... Nous n'avons nous avons reconstitué pas euh, au moment, mais je pense dans les années 20, dans les années 30, il y a euh, une législation qui va intéresser les projectionnistes et, et, et les projectionnistes ont besoin d'un euh, permis pour faire pour, faire, pour, pour projeter les films. Et alors, je, je pense que, que, la, que les mots euh, projectionnistes arrivent avec la législation. Mais c'est difficile à dire. C'est difficile pourquoi l'historien de la langue, il y a un, un historien de la langue, de la langue italienne très important, qui est, qui est Sergio Raffaelli, euh, ne suivent pas la question de la différenciation de la, de la, de la, de la, de la parole opérateur in opérateur et opérateur et projectionniste. Et, vous avez compris? No. Oui, oui, oui. Merci. No, so, oh, oh, ok. Um, the, 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 the change of the world is in the 20, in, in the 20s. I think it is in the 20s. But we have no, no source now uh, we have no um, uh, preliminary study of historian of the language 
that um, so I'm not sure that the word projectionist arrive in 20s, in late 20s or in 30s. Uh, we uh, we only know that in the, the in the in the in the tense well, the, 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 we use only the word uh, operateur, operatore. It's a the differentiation say avec the the uh, is uh, is uh, using other words like operatore alla macchina or uh, um, operatore di cabina. Operatore di cabina is projectionist. Operatore alla macchina is cameraman. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, Louis, would you like me to continue? Uh, yes, yes, go ahead. Questions. Okay. We may not get on this. There's a lot of questions, which is a sign of the. The great success of this conference, but I'm going to try to be fair and go in order. Um, this is a question, I believe, for Guy Edmonds about whether there are simulations of the kinds of projection effects you're talking about, the flicker effects for contemporary audiences. If you know of any. Uh, sorry, contemporary in the sense of modern now, day? Of today. Um, So uh, reprogramming of the uh, digital light projector and that kind of thing. Um, there, there have been some attempts um, where you take the uh, the DCP, the the digitized material uh, of a, a film, um, and you try and insert black frames in between the, the picture frames um, to kind of replicate the effect of a shutter. Mm -hmm. And there have been reports that that gives quite a quite a good feeling of film. Actually, um, it's not something I've seen myself, um, and it's it's kind of only been done at the odd conference, uh, kind of uh, SMPT, or I think they did it um, uh, in Paris um, um, maybe a couple of years ago. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of aware of uh, attempts to, in a way, it's the, the logical uh, kind of step of, of what I've been looking at is to, to make a digital replica of these early shutters. Um, but I think that's also not, not quite the point. Um, mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to convey with the idea of flick escape is that there's all sorts of different things going on at once. and they they're variable at really quite a fine level. So taking the cinema screens or, or not even cinemas, of course, but the, the places that uh, audience, audiences would have seen um, uh, moving images in the 1900s in just one city, then the public would have been encountering many different types of non-standardized technology using many different types of shutter, uh, different lighting systems, and, and hence um, the, the idea of kind of terming this uh, a flick escape. OK, thank you. I'm going to try to get to everybody. Um, <coughs> question question is for uh, Frédéric. There's um, a question on the sound. If you have explored the sound in your history of Tanagra, the um, question of the bon animateur, the effect of sound, etc. Frédéric n'est pas là. Vous voyez, je, je, je suis en train de regarder le texte. OK, je vais passer. Uh, I'm going to go to Lucy. Um, lots of questions for you, Lucy. I'm going to pick out one so we can get to everybody, and I'll do another kind of loop around um, if we still have time. Um, this is coming from Prisca, I believe, and it's about the economics of owning a camera that you talked mm -hmm. about in the US. And she's pointing to phenomena in France and elsewhere where there was, um, there was financial aid, there were rentals, there were other options. And mm -hmm. I think part the gist of the question is, what were the options for a cameraman who might not have been able to afford their own camera or yeah. and what um, kind of <clears throat> yeah the um I mean the cost of it was kind of used as a means to kind of uh keep the market from over flooding because like everything particularly with Hollywood you know you had an overabundance of labor um <clears throat> so there was used cameras was was it was more common in the American um, market so in American cinematographer and various things people would sell their second hand so once the 
um, more established cinematographers were selling off their pathés and debris and things like that when they were getting the Bell and Howes and then later the Mitchells, they would sell theirs or sometimes maybe even give one to their assistant cameraman. So the help was all, um, you know, very, very American up from your own bootstraps kind of <laughs> take on it that you had to figure it out on your own. Um, and I think she mentioned also the um, things like repairs and insurance. I'm, I'm not aware of any kind of insurance, but repairs would be done by the studio. So once you were at a studio, they had the what the camera department was, was a machine shop. Um, so any repairs, any um, um, uh, that repairs that were needed during a shoot would be taken care of at the studio. Okay, thank you. Um, several questions for Katarina. Um, I'm going to pick out one here. Um, a question about, um, a question about split screen versus frames within a frame. Do we need to make that distinction and what would be the implications? Um, well, I, I started out um, trying to like looking at split screens, but then I realized very, very quickly that um, it's impossible to make a clear distinction between that and that because they're made the same way. You uh, cover part of the frame and then you expose it or print it in later. So um, this is basically the, the, the struggle I was uh, initially um, dealing with that there is no way to distinguish between um, frame within a frame or a split screen and they're exactly the same. So um, I think the main challenge right now for me is that to distinguish clearly between um, uh, frames that use matting. This is how I define it for myself. Um, did, the, did the shot use matting or did it not use matting to be created? But then also because you can also mat within the set, um, it, it, it like flows into like regular superimposition very quickly. So it's it's difficult to delineate, but I, I do, do not think that, that it makes any sense to make a, a distinction between frames within frames and split screens. <laughs> Hey, um, I'm looping back around to, is, has Frederic joined us? No, huh? Uh -uh. No. No, okay, I'm gonna look back to um, Guy Edmonds. Um, a question about, excuse me for finding that again. We have so many questions. <laughs> finding is not easy. It's about the feedback loop. And the feedback loop you describe between audiences and showmen and whether other people and other professions played a role here, such as cinema owners or distributors. In the, you know, as an agent yeah. for changing the technology. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, and again, I guess the, the other, the, the feedback loop could, could pan out into all those different um, uh, trades of, of the, of early cinema. Um, I'm imagining a, a more uh, kind of slightly tighter grouping of basically the technologists um, uh, also a, a kind of an early cinema dispositif where the, the, the projectionist who might also be the person who actually made the projector or the film um, is in a space with the audience um, and you get quite a nice uh, instant feedback um, and there, there's quite a nice um, uh, section in one of the Charles Urban catalogs where he really he gives credit to the um, the itinerant showman the his customers basically who are, who are giving him fairly instant feedback on what the machine is doing and and then you see these uh, changes in the shutter design appear within um, two or three years from 1897 1898 to 1901, there's a lot of happening in Urban's designs at that point. Um, and he does does credit that, that kind of tight knit uh, grouping. Um, so that's that's kind of what I'm Im imagining uh, uh, as, as the, the feedback loop. Yeah. Je vais passer à Luca et Silvio. Il y a une autre question qui a uh, un peu une variation de, de la question que j'ai posée tantôt. Um, et je vais la lire. Uh... En France, les opérateurs de prise de vue s'émancipent de leurs camarades projectionnistes progressivement depuis l'intérieur du syndicat des opérateurs. Est-ce est pareil en Italie? Euh, non. <rire> euh, ce n'est pas la même situation euh, parce que les opérateurs, les projectionnistes s'organisent... Euh, ah, là, 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 là. Okay. 
No, no, lo capisco. Ok. Della Fosci. 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 Ok. Um... Les, les projectionnistes s'organisent euh, en, en avance, euh, et, mais euh, la, la, la FORCI, c'est une organisation de, 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 exclusivement des projectionnistes qui, est, qui avance, des, qui, qui a des ré, revendications, mais son, son action euh, syndical n'a pas une n'a pas succès n'a pas, pas de succès et euh, donc euh, les, les, les efforts pionnieristiques des projectionnistes de, 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 de s'organiser euh, s'écrasent contre la résistance des, euh, des propriétaires des salles de, de, de cinéma et des et de, 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 de l'exploitation et, euh, et donc euh, on assiste à une, une, une véritable euh, déclin, de, de crise de, de la syndicalisation des projectionnistes euh, à peu près vers la, la moitié de, des années X et euh, au contraire on assiste à la, à la euh, syndicalisation des, des opérateurs euh, de prise de vue mais c'est le parcours des opérateurs de prise de vue vers la syndicalisation, c'est autonome. Il n'y a pas un dialogue entre les deux catégories des opérateurs. Et il y a une, 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 une véritable séparation même dans la, dans la syndicalisation. Merci. Um, next question is back to Lucy. Uh, a question about how the situation you describe with the separation of, a, of an industry as we know it, that's economics and distribution and whatnot, and an industry that's about technology manufacture, how that compares to the European situation, if you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm not as familiar with the European situation, but I think um, that question mentioned that it, they did stay more connected, that Pathé continued to, to make technology. Um, I think in the U.S. context that separation, there's a lot of factors. I think uh, the industry um, probably more readily embraced a sort of corporate capitalist model. Um, and um, I think the establishment of something like the Society of Motion Picture Engineers really helps to contribute and create a really separate um, uh, community of companies that are focused on technology. And I think that the geography of the country where production is happening Um, so predominantly away from the industrial centers of the country um, where most technology is manufactured has a, has a huge part in that, that separation. So I think those um, sort of unique characteristics of the American film industry where we have such a huge geographic separation between production center and um, I, but both the sort of academic science and um, technology manufacturing largely still on the East Coast um, creates that that separation in the American industry. I can add um, one quick, quick, quick addendum here, which is that if you look at the German situation, there's a group mm -hmm. called Deutsche Kino Technische Gesellschaft that arises in 1919, and they're mm -hmm. absolutely taking their cue from the Society of Motion Picture Engineers, mm -hmm. and they're trying to refigure the, the understanding of industry as technological manufacturing. I say a lot more about it, but there are a lot of resonances yeah. in the paper for me. Um, so yeah. there are some, some um, echoes here. Mm -hmm. 